but I will repeat for the sake of the video and also for those who came in a little bit late and didn't hear the expl explanation about why I have a patch on my eye. <laughs> what? Because I'm a pirate. Arr! Um, yeah, I, I, I said earlier I should have taken a magic marker and painted and colored it black. Yeah. Um, now, earlier this week I was uh, trying to sharpen some blades underneath a zero turn mower and with a grinder and got some of the grindings in my eye. So my eye is scratched. All right. Oh, there I did it again. All right. I haven't done that in a long time. I've been trying not to do that. I forgot. All right. <laughs> we found in one of the chairs a business card for James Cowboy Watson with American Eagle Logistics. Did somebody lose this card last Shabbat? It was sitting in a seat back here about, about where Robert is sitting right now. Okay. And then, um, is Ann Wilborn here? Joe's, Joe Scott, uh, Scott and Joe Cacho. Ca is it Cacho or Catch it? I don't know how to say the last name, but I think Anne is Joe's mom. Okay. I need you, maybe, uh, if you have connection with her. She put in a CD request form. Um, she said for you to ignore it. I answered her question. Of, I found in my notes where it was. She'll go online, and she said to oh, you to ignore it. Okay, I, yeah, because she had put some, she had put binding and deliverance on here. I've never done a message called binding and deliverance. I had no idea what message it was it that was she part was wanting. Spiritual warfare teaching. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right. Well, that's taken care of then too. All right. Now we move on. This is in some ways a continuation of the ma message that I gave last Shabbat. Uh, if you were not here, um, the message that I did last Shabbat was called This Mind, based upon the scripture that says, let this mind be in you which is also in Messiah Yeshua. And um, we talked about what, what does that actually mean. And if, if we actually do what that scripture is telling us to do, what, what is opened up to us? Possibilities that are opened to us. Today is August 16th, 2014, and on the Hebrew calendar, the 20th day of Av, 5774, I've entitled this message, Perfect Peace. In Yeshiahu, Isaiah, chapter 26, Verse 3, the prophet, if you, have, if you have a King James Version Bible, I'm going to be quoting the scripture originally from there because that's the way I learned it when I was growing up. It says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. I want us to actually look at both verses 3 and 4 
And now, if you will help me, I, I took the liberty of taking the Hebrew words and retranslating them. And I will read to you. You, yod heh vav -Hey, will guard with fidelity to preserve him in completeness, peace, and tranquility, whose purpose is to lean, lay, and rest on you because he has confidence that he is secure in you. And then verse 4 says, Have confidence in yod -Heh vav -Heh perpetually, for Yah, yod -Heh vav -Heh, is an ancient, continuous, perpetual rock. I don't know if you guys can see that or not, but I want to point out some things to you. It's very interesting when you read this in the original text because when it says to preserve him in completeness, peace, and tranquility, the original text actually uses shalom twice. It says, Shalom, Shalom. Which, in Hebrew, when you have a word or a phrase repeated more than once, it, it, it means an emphasis or a, or a greatness to it. Okay? So this isn't just Shalom. This is Shalom, Shalom. Okay? The other interesting thing is down here in verse 4. It says for Yah yod heh vav -Heh, It re basically repeats the name. If you, if you look in the translation for the original text. Now it does, it does the Hebrew text actually does say Yah. And then follows up with the full, the complete Tetragrammaton. But when it's translated, it's translated as Yahweh, Yahweh. Okay. Again, it is, this is a repetition thing showing the greatness of our God. Our great God is an ancient, continuous, perpetual rock. And this term that's used here is tsur. Hebrew word is tsur, T-S-U-R. It means rock or great boulder. It doesn't say it in the in the in the translation of the word, but we here in America are familiar with the rock of Gibraltar. And, and there's a concept, you know, we have a concept surrounding the whole idea of the Rock of Gibraltar being, being there forever. And so if you were, to, if you were to, to somehow tie yourself to the Rock of Gibraltar, it's never going to move, never going to shift. Of course, we know that natural rocks don't have that eternal quality. And one day they will break and fall and burn up and do all that. But the, the concept is that He is something that is eternal and will never break, will never shift, will never give way. I also want to take us over to Matit Yahu Matthew chapter 6.
verses 25 through 34. Matthew, Matthew 6, 25. Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear? Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds flying about. They neither plant nor harvest, nor do they gather food into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they are? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to his life? And why be anxious about clothing? Think about the fields of wild irises and how they grow. They neither work nor spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Shlomo in all his glory was clothed as beautifully as one of these. If this is how God clothes grass in the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, thrown in an oven, won't He much more clothe you? What little trust you have. So don't be anxious asking, what will we eat? What will we drink? Or how will we be clothed? For it is the pagans who set their hearts on all these things. Your heavenly Father knows you need them all. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Today has enough tsuras or problems already. I also want to point out something else about this passage up here. You see, I under, underline purpose. This word means whose, not just whose goal at the present time is, but whose purpose for existence is to lean, lay, and rest. On Yote Vape. And I would ask the question, by the way, as I'm sharing this, I'm not sharing it as one who has arrived and so you guys all need to catch up with me. We're all walking this journey together. And, and what I'm going to share today, I'm, I'm not there either. But it's where I believe God is wanting us to go. And as we look at our lives, as we evaluate, you know, what we do, how we feel, what we think, how we live our lives, what we spend our time on, and so on, we have to ask the question. Is the purpose of our existence in reality not, I'm not talking about conceptually, I'm talking about in reality every day. Is our purpose in life to lean, lay, and rest on Yod Heh Vav Heh? Or do we, as a general rule, concern ourselves with the very things that Yeshua said, don't be concerned about those things? Don't worry about them. Now, Yeshua wasn't saying you don't need to work anymore. You can just sit down and take it easy and, and uh, everything will be taken care, care of for you. And I've actually known people who interpreted it that way and expected everyone else to take care of them. And they would mooch off of everyone else. That's not what this scripture is saying. It's talking about 
as you live your life, what, what is the purpose of your existence? And the next question that goes along with this is, who is the real you? If I were to ask you to describe yourself, most of us, me included, if somebody said, give a description of yourself. You know, for me, I would say, I'm, my name is Michael Wallace. I am 54 years old. I'm balding, or bald, I should say. I'm, I'm bald as a cue ball. Uh, I have blue eyes. I'm six foot one. You know, I would... I would rattle off all the different aspects of this physical body. And, and yet, this physical body is not us. This body has been called a shell it's been called an earth suit. Uh, even by an author that I've been reading, it's called a costume. And to define the word costume, it means, to dre uh, it means dress or garb characteristic of another person. And so we walk around on this planet in a costume. This is not the real us. This. This is a costume that we're wearing. This costume eventually is going to go the way of dust. And the real us is going to live on for eternity. And so... Our shell or our costume is not us. And yet, our shell, our costume, yells louder than anything else in our lives. It's constantly wanting attention of some kind. And I don't know if, if you guys remember an ad that came out a few years ago back when they first introduced the stain pins that you could carry around with you in your purse or in your pocket. There's one particular ad where a young man goes in for a job interview and he has a stain on his pocket. And I don't know how they did it. They got a hand in there somehow. But but this hand is back behind the stain and, and, the, and the stain is talking while, while every time that he tries to talk. And I've asked Nathaniel to illustrate, help me illustrate this. Oh, you don't have to come up here. You can sit where you're sitting. You just need to watch me. And so... I'll tell you when. And so, when, when we are trying to live for God, when we're trying to have a relationship with God, our costume yells and talks over what we're trying to do with God. And so, for instance, when I go and try to pray, then, then every time I say something, then there, there's this shell of mine that is speaking over me. And when I try to get louder, it gets louder. And even when I shout, it's shouting <laughs> You can turn your mic off now. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you, you understand the concept. Our, because we, because of the way that God made us with this body, all of the input that we get from the outer world coming in through all of our senses, we take this information in and then in our minds we believe that that requires some kind of response. Okay? And so our flesh constantly is shouting to us to comply and to respond to the stimuli that's coming in. Okay. This is where, you know, when the scripture says that we have to, to basically, Rob Shul talks about pummeling our body. Um, the scripture talks about the old man dying. Okay. There has to come a point at which that does not supersede the relationship with God. We, there are steps that we have to take to silence that man. Okay? Because he is going to continually scream. And, and, and that man is selfish. That man is self-centered. He wants attention. And he wants it now. And he wants it all the time. And he doesn't take no for an answer. Okay? And so, you know, we have, especially in this, in this society here in the United States, we have so many different things that we are engaged in during the course of, of our weeks. And, and so we... We have just plain old busyness going on in our lives. And then we add to that things like TV and games and movies and music and, and Harley Davidson motorcycles that are really, really loud. And, and now I'm not, please don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying through this, you got to get rid of your TV and your games and your movies and your music and your Harley Davidson motorcycle. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this. In this society, we go for those things. And I believe that the reason why we go for those things is because of the fact that they make noise. They make noise so that it occupies us so that we don't ever have to get still and get quiet. Because if we got still and got quiet, we actually might have to deal with some things. Okay? And so we choose these things that constantly cause noise and constantly feed our, the attention of our shell. Okay? So that we don't have to think so that we don't have to consider that maybe there's something else other than this. Something more that God wants for us and wants of us. And every time that we talk about um, any of these kinds of things, there, there's this, it's almost like terror that strikes our heart. Don't take my TV away. Don't take my games away from me. If you take those things away from me, what am I going to do? I won't have the pleasure that I desire. And, and so, and we all do this. The things that we love to do that occupy our time, we don't want anybody or anything taking those things away from us. And it's not an issue of that, it's, that these things are evil, quote unquote, but we allow 
these things to be used by our costume to occupy all of our senses so that we stay constantly tied to this physical existence. The old man wants to main, maintain control at all times. Now if we're talking about, you know, there are other issues that people have problems with that are wrong, that are sin. Overeating, alcoholism, drug addiction, sexual addiction, cigarettes, pornography. Anything that controls you instead of you controlling it. That is your, that is your, your shell, your costume, screaming at you for attention constantly. It wants the attention. And so I know for myself that many times my quiet time with God can actually be quite difficult. And the only way that I would be able to reach that place of, of peace where my, where my shell, my costume is not yelling at me, I would have to spend hours in solitude to finally get it to shut up. And that's how, how powerful that part of us is. In Romans chapter 6, Romans 6, 12 through 14. And before I read this, I just I, I want to kind of press the issue and reiterate this. And this holds true every for every single one of us. And it's some it may be something different for each one. But if you have anything in your life, anything that is controlling you, and you're not controlling it. Through, through the help of God and the Holy Spirit, that thing is a sin. Why can I say that? Because that means that that particular thing is not submitted to God. Okay? That aspect of your life is not under, under the rule of God. It's under the rule of the flesh. And I know that's convicting. It's convicting to me. But it's the truth. Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 14 says, Therefore, do not let sin rule in your mortal bodies. So that it makes you obey its desires. And do not offer any part of yourselves to sin as an instrument for wickedness. On the contrary, offer yourselves to God as people alive from the dead and your various parts to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no authority over you because you are not under legalism but under grace. What does that last statement mean? You're not under legalism but under grace. It's not what many Christians say that it means. What it means is you are never going to be able to whip yourself into shape by strictly following the rules and regulations set down by God. The only way that you can overcome your flesh 
and overcome the sin in your life is by submitting to the power of the Ruach HaKodesh who gives us the ability to overcome sin. That's what grace is. You know, a lot of times, you'll, you're, most of the time actually, you'll hear grace defined as unmerited favor. Well, that's only one aspect of the definition of grace. And actually, a, a fairly small aspect of the definition. Grace, the definition of grace, or the main definition of grace, is actually the ability given to us by the Ruach HaKodesh to do all that God has asked us to do. It's empowerment to obey. Empowerment to submit. And so, we have to make sure, we have to determine that our shell, our costume, is not going to be the one that we heed. Before we can hear the Father, we have to make our shell shut up. Because just like that illustration that we did with Nathaniel, when you try to talk to the Father, your shell is screaming louder than you can talk. So we have to get to the point where we shut that up and say you are not going to control me and who I am. You are not the definition of who I am. God created me to be more than what this is. This is temporal. It's going to go away. God's not going to even try. Yes, we will have a quote-unquote glorified body. I don't think we need to worry about things like, you know, what if somebody died by being chopped up or burned or whatever. God, God's not worried about, about that. He's the one who created all of this out of nothing, so He doesn't have to start with something else to create. And we are going to have a glorified body and it's going to be a body that is recognizable to others as being us, as being ours. But you understand, He doesn't have to reclaim this. There's nothing that says that He has to use the elements of this body to make that new one that He's going to give to us. And so, this can go to dust. It means nothing. But the real you, the person who is sitting here listening to this, thinking about this, and hopefully receiving some inspiration from the Holy Spirit right now, that part is the real you. And the real you needs to be able to hear this. The real you needs to be able to take control over the physical body that you're in and not allow the things of this world to remove you from the place of perfect peace. What does it say? It says, God, Yote Vavhe, will preserve us in a state of peace, completeness, and tranquility if our purpose is to lean, lay, and rest on Him. If the purpose of our life. 
I want to finish with Ivrim, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. You know, last Shabbat we talked about the mind of Yeshua, Yeshua saying that He only did what He saw the Father doing and He only spoke what He heard the Father speaking. Yeshua's purpose in life was to remain in a state of leaning, laying, resting on His Father. And therefore, He was in perfect peace. He also didn't let his shell speak. Verses 14 through 16 of Ivrim, Hebrews chapter 4 says, Therefore, since we have a great Kohen Gadol who has passed through to the highest heaven, Yeshua, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we acknowledge as true. For we do not have a Kohen Gadol unable to empathize with our weaknesses, since in every respect he was tempted just as we are, the only difference being that he did not sin. Therefore let us confidently approach the throne from which God gives grace, from which God gives the empowerment to do what we ought, so that we may receive mercy and find that empowerment in our time of need. What does this say about Yeshua? All of the same, all of the same things came at Him. All of the same stimuli that we experience, He experienced. But what did He do when His, when His shell, his costume, tried to scream at him. He said, you shut up. I'm not going to listen to you. My ear is trained on the Father. I'm going to listen to him. And you can't speak. I, I will not let you speak. I understand that we are not Yeshua. We were... Yeshua was unique. He was not born of a physical father. And therefore, the sin nature that is passed down from generation to generation for all other human beings, He didn't get that. We, we, have, we have a great struggle with that nature that, was, that we were born into or born with. But let me, in case you somehow think that Yeshua was able to just skate through His existence on the earth, all of the things, all of the times when we are unable to say no to our flesh. When we're unable to stop that voice. When we give in to the demands of the flesh. Every single one of those for every single human being that ever has existed, does exist, and will exist, all landed on Him. He had to carry the weight of all of that simultaneously. I cannot, uh, we can't even imagine, we can't fathom what that would be like. And so, He bore all of that, but we do for us 
so that we could escape. So that we would have the ability, by the grace of God, to learn how to say no to this shell and yes to God. Let's pray. Abba, the reality, the reality is that we can hear the truth. We can know the truth in our minds. We can all in this room know that everything that I just said was the truth. But until and unless you intervene by your Ruach HaKodesh, unless you energize the truth and make it personal and real for us, it will only be that. It will just be truth. It will not be life for us. Abba, I ask for all of us that you move us from the place of considering all of these things merely as concepts to the place of actually living what has just been said. We all need your help. We all need your intervention. We all need your grace. Father, thank you that you are a God that leads us progressively, that you teach us, and that you're patient and merciful with us as we learn that you don't try to stuff a whole steak down our mouth, but that you give us small bites. But Father, I pray that we will truly eat of the meat, that we will be willing to take the bites, one by one, until the steak is gone. In Yeshua's name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, our Lord, our righteousness, our salvation, the Prince of Peace. Amen.